<clears throat> Hello, everyone. It's Glenn Rawson, and uh, you probably weren't expecting to see me tonight, but uh, because I, I did tell Jason back in Utah that I probably wouldn't come on tonight and do a fireside, but I found myself with some time on a Sunday afternoon here in Hawaii, and so I decided to give it a shot. So here I am, and uh, we'll see me tonight do a fireside. But I found myself. Oh, hold on, time I'm on talking to myself. So I am here and uh, going to share a few stories with you. Interestingly enough, four of the six stories relate to the islands, especially to Hawaii. So thank you for joining me. I started just a moment or so early to make sure the equipment would work and that I would be there on time at, uh, at eight o'clock. And my understanding is it's eight o'clock in Utah right now, so it should be right on the time when I'm supposed to go. So here it is, this is a makeshift effort. And as you can see behind me, I don't have any elaborate backdrop. I'm in my hotel room, which is the only place where I have Wi-Fi. So here I am. I am on an amazing vacations tour in Hawaii right now with 21 of the most wonderful people. We have had a great time talking about Hawaiian history, American history, and especially church history here on the island of Oahu. And I'm gonna share a little bit of that history uh, from the island of Hawaii, and I hope you enjoy it. First of all, I wanted to let you know that, that coming out from Glenn Ross and Stories, there is a brand new book coming, and it is the stories of the New Testament. We finished all the editing, it's with the printer. That book should be out right around the 1st of April. This is, again, a culmination of work uh, going all the way back to about 1990 when I first started working on this material. So a lot of years of work, 30 plus years of work on this book about the stories on the life of the Savior. So that's coming out from Glenn Ross and Stories very soon. Also, I just wanted to let you know that those one day tours, those are out there. Tours of Salt Lake Valley, Utah Valley, Cache Valley, the, uh, the Fall Colors Tour right after General Conference, and more. If you're interested in going on one of these one-day church history tours, keep watching on Facebook and we'll give you more information as it, as it becomes available. You're invited and I would love to have you come. All right, this very first story is, a, is one that is probably old and familiar to some of you. It happened in 1921 when President David O. McKay Elder David O. McKay of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and Elder Hugh Cannon were making a tour, a world tour of the missions. They came to Hawaii. They had a day of meetings in Hilo, Hawaii, and that night they decided that they, could, they would take a trip up to the Kilauea volcano. It was arranged for them and for all the visiting brethren and the missionaries. And then about nine o'clock that night, in two cars, they drove up to Kilauea. Uh, at that time, Kilauea was a very active volcano. Well, uh, Virginia Bud Jacobson, who was in the group, tells the following story. She said, we stood on the fiery rim of that, or the rim of that fiery pit, watching Pele in her satanic antics. She said, our backs chilled by the cold sweeping down from snow-capped Mauna Loa, and our faces blistered by the heat of the molten lava right in front of them. So you've got the cold mountain behind them, the wind coming down, and you've got the lava right in front of them coming up from the volcano. Well, one of the elders saw an opportunity and discovered that right down inside the rim of the volcano, there was a ledge about four feet down inside the crater where you could stand and look at the volcano in front of you, the lava right below you without being hit by that cold wind. He crawled down and stood on it. It seemed perfectly sound 
and there was something of a railing on the open side of it that formed a bit of a protection from the intense heat. It was an excellent place to view the spectacular display, Sister Jacobson said. Well, after first testing its safety, Brother McKay and three of the elders climbed down onto that hanging balcony inside the crater of the volcano. And there they stood, warm and comfortable. They teased the others up above who refused or hesitated in taking advantage of this protection that they had found. Well, Sister Jacobs had said, for quite some time, we all watched the ever-changing sight as we alternately chilled and roasted from up on top. After being down there in that protected spot for some time, Brother McKay, Elder McKay, all of a sudden said to those with him, brethren, I feel impressed that we should get out of here, end of quote. And with that, the elders began to climb out, and Elder McKay assisted each one of them to climb up and out of the inside of that volcano, and he was the last one. They reached down, took him by the hand, lifted him up, and just as they did, that balcony crumbled and dropped with a roar into the molten lava some 100 feet below. Now, it's easy, she said, to visualize the feelings of those who witnessed this terrifying experience. Not a word was said. The whole thing was too awful, she said, with all that that word means. The only sound was the hiss and roar of Pele, the fire goddess of old Hawaii, screaming her disappointment. Sister Jacobson concludes, None of us who were witnesses of this experience could ever doubt the reality of revelation in our day. Some might say it was merely inspiration, but to us, it was a direct revelation given to a worthy man, end of quote. Can you imagine? And things like that, I'm just simple-minded enough to believe that things like that happen all the time. Second story. <coughs> now, there's two stories that come together here. The first one um, is this one. October 30th, 1838, an angry mob of Missourians attacked the small Latter-day Saint settlement of Hans Mill. It was a vicious, premeditated attack that in the end took the lives of 17 Latter-day Saint men and boys and others wounded. As the shooting stopped, the mob closed in on the blacksmith shop and there they discovered two small boys hiding beneath the bellows in the blacksmith shop. They were Alma and Sardius Smith. Sardius, 11 years old, was brutally murdered by the mob. I won't even tell you what they did. And then one of the mobbers pointed his weapon at Alma and fired at point-blank range. As the mob fled after looting the settlement, it was Willard Smith, the two brothers' older brother, who first crept out of hiding to survey what he would later describe as a holocaust. Stepping over the body of his father at the entrance into the blacksmith shop, he found his brother Sardius dead and his brother Alma barely alive. Picking him up, he started walking out when he met his mother, Amanda Barnes Smith, whom screamed, they have killed my little Alma. No, mother. Willard replied, but father and Sardius are dead. Well, together, Amanda and Willard carried the gravely wounded Alma to their tent and laid him on a bed of straw. They found that the entirety of his left hip had been shot away by the blast, leaving the ends of the bones between the femur and the, and the pelvis inches apart 
It was, he said, a ghastly sight. Amanda gathered her remaining children around Alma and fervently prayed for him. If it was the Lord's will, would, she he would he help her to help him? And with that, as you know the story, inspiration flowed into Amanda's soul, and she was directed by revelation to take the ashes from her fire and make a lie. And with that lie, she washed that terrible wound. She washed it and cleaned it until she said it was as white as chicken's flesh. She prayed again and felt impressed to make a poultice from the bark of the slippery elm tree. Willard described going out into the woods in the dark, fearing that the mob would come back and murder them at any moment. And yet in terror, he obeyed his mother and collected the bark. After she had made the poultice, she dressed the wound, laid Alma on his stomach, and only then, she said, could she give vent to her tears and her terror. Well, by that inspiration and revelation, that terrible night of October 30th, 31st, 1838, there would come a miracle. A mere five weeks later, Alma Lamoni Smith leaped off of his bed of confinement and danced about the cabin floor. Quote, a flexible gristle having grown in place of the missing joint and socket. On that brand new hip, Alma Smith would follow his family in their flight to Illinois and from Illinois across the plains to Salt Lake City. And from there, Alma Lamoni Smith would serve numerous missions all on foot walking hither and yon, never troubled again. Now, second related story. In, um, in 18, about 1860, yeah, it was 1861, Latter-day Saint missionaries first came to these islands, and I'll tell you about it, about 1850. And from 1850 to about 1857, they labored among these Hawaiians, bringing many thousands of converts. But then in 1857, with the Utah War, the Latter-day Saint missionaries here in Hawaii were called home, again, because of Johnston's army, leaving the Hawaiians adrift, as it were, and young in the faith. Well, then in 1861-62, a Latter-day Saint named Walter Murray Gibson came down here to Hawaii and set himself up as the presiding priesthood officer among the Hawaiians here in on the island of Lanai. And he began to do things which were rather odd, changing the administration of the sacrament, selling priesthood offices, soliciting funds from church members and buying up all kinds of property in his name. Well, finally, word reached Salt Lake, what Gibson was doing, and a group of Latter-day Saint priesthood officers were sent down to investigate what Gibson was doing down here. They were led by Elder Lorenzo Snow. When they arrived, now this is in 1864, Lorenzo Snow and his company were going to travel by boat from Honolulu to Lahaina. As they, and as they were preparing to go, Joseph F. Smith, who had served a mission here as a 15-year-old boy, said, those waters aren't safe. I'm not going to go. Nevertheless, Elder Snow set out. They hadn't gone far, presumably out by the reef somewhere, when waves caught their craft and flipped it over, and all of the brethren were thrown into the water. Well, the, um, the missionaries uh, and the native Hawaiians immediately jumped into the water and went out and drug all of the men to shore. They found them all, but after five minutes, they, they still could not find Lorenzo Snow. They finally found him submerged beneath the water, and they dragged him to shore. Quickly, they gave Elder Snow a blessing. No response. 
A couple of missionaries standing by were determined. They took the apostle and rolled him face down, it is said, over a barrel or something like that to expel the water that he had swallowed. But still, no response. The natives standing by said, give it up. He's dead. You can't save him. But the two missionaries refused to give him up. They knelt and prayed again. And then they felt impressed to try something most unusual for that day. Taking turns, they blew into Elder Snow's lungs to reinflate, reinflate them. And they kept at it and kept at it. And then suddenly, there was a slight wink of an eye and then a rattle in the throat. Lorenzo Snow would live thanks to that same faith and inspiration. For you see, one of, the, one of those missionaries was Elder Benjamin Clough, but the other one was Alma Lamoni Smith, the same Alma Lamoni Smith who was saved by the inspiration and revelation received by his mother. And now, how ironic that some 30 years later, he would save the life of a future president of the church the same way. Now, this research, I am indebted to Chad Orton of the Church History Library, who first obtained this information. The first, as I said, the first missionaries that came here to Hawaii came in 1850-51. It's an interesting story how it came about, because you see, as you know, the Miners 49er, the gold rush to California in 1849, they did indeed find a lot of gold. And as you probably know, President Brigham Young in the Salt Lake Valley wasn't very complimentary of these men who wanted to run off and mine for gold in California. In fact, he said, you go dig for your gold, we'll stay here and farm, and in a few years, we'll be way richer than you ever could be. But nonetheless, it was undoubtable that there was a great deal of gold coming out of California. So Brigham and the others called gold mining missionaries and sent them to California to dig for gold on behalf of the church. There were a number of them, about 10 of these men, who were sent into California. Well, we are now 1850, and Elder Charles C. Rich of the Quorum of the Twelve comes to California and, among other things, assesses the condition of the Latter-day Saints, collects tithing with Elder Amos Lyman, and then while he is with some of them, he says to them, you know, you might as well spend the winter in, in the Sandwich Islands as to spend it here high up in the Sierras. So Brother Rich, Elder Rich, called George Q. Cannon, Henry Bigler, and a number of others to go to the Sandwich Islands to become missionaries in the winter of 1850. Well... <laughs> that was the call. Now, these men were on the American River at a place called Slapjack Bar, high up in the Sierra Nevadas, when this call by Elder Rich came, and they were given a time of departure. And one of the reasons that Elder Rich wanted them to go to Hawaii is he didn't want them to winter over up there in the mining camps where it was more than likely they would fall prey to drinking, gambling, and the immoral life of the miners. Well, the brethren accepted the call. But in order to, to pay for their, their mission to Hawaii, they needed to find some gold. So they built a dam on the river with which to pan and sluice for gold, and then a flood came down through the canyon and destroyed their dam, along with all the other dams up and down the river. Well, most of the miners just pulled up stakes and left. But the brethren decided to stick it out. They immediately rebuilt the dam. 
Needing a miracle, they rebuilt the dam and began to work their claim. And their efforts paid off beautifully. They struck gold. For two weeks, they pulled gold out of the mine, out of their claim. And then, just as fast as it came on, the claim ran out. Henry Bigler would write in his diary, probably, no doubt, it is all right, meaning it's a good thing. For our eyes might have been so filled with gold dust, they might not have been able to see, end of quote. So the brethren, with the gold dust that they had, set out for San Francisco and boarded a boat in the harbor at Hawaii. And just as they did, a storm struck the Bay Area and trapped their ship in the harbor at anchor. They were unable to leave. Well, it was during those difficult days in San Francisco, eager to get out of the harbor and sail south to Hawaii, that George Q. Cannon had a remarkable dream that would indeed change the course of missionary work in Hawaii. In the dream, the ship's crew was struggling to try to get the anchor up off the bottom, and they couldn't. It was held fast on the bottom of the harbor. And in his dream, George saw the prophet Joseph Smith standing on the deck. George approached him and heard the prophet Joseph pray aloud that the anchor might be loosed from the bottom. And thereafter, one of the men of the ship's crew raised the anchor with ease. George said to the prophet something to this effect, I wish I had faith like that. And Joseph responded by saying that such faith was indeed his privilege and that he ought to have it. Well, evidently, that dream proved prophetic. And shortly after, the ship set sail and the missionaries reached Honolulu, December the 12th, 1850, nearly three months after they had received their call on the American River in San Francisco. Elder Cannon wrote, quote, the Lord ordered all things for the best, and I could not help thinking of my dream and Joseph's words in regard to faith, end of quote. I'll talk more about this in just a moment. First of all, how are you doing? It's I hope you can hear me all right. I hope that this thing is working okay. I really can't tell whether the audio is working okay, how the light is, but I hope it's okay. Uh, I wanted to let you know, some of you have been asking. Indeed, History of the Saints, Dennis Lyman and myself will be leading two tours in June, the last two weeks of June, across the Pioneer Trail. What's gonna happen? Well, in the first tour, June 16th, we're going to set out from Salt Lake City in a bus and go back along the, the Pioneer Trail all the way from This Is The Place Heritage Park on through Wyoming, Nebraska, down into Missouri, and eventually to Nauvoo, where we will then send the first group home after we've covered the trail, all the way from the end of Parley Street, or excuse me, from This Is The Place Monument to Parley Street. Then we'll bring a second group out. They'll fly out to meet us, and we will get back on the bus, and literally from the end of Parley Street, we will go all the way back along that trail with that second group and show the same spots, teach the trail, from, and that trail was covered by the saints from 1846 all the way to 1869. We will show the places, the sites, the, the landmarks, and the stories of that trail. That is coming up the last two weeks of June, 2023. You're invited to come. If you want more information, go to historyofthesaints.org or contact me and we can help you with it. I would love to have you come. 
I want to have a bus full of people out on that trail and share those marvelous stories. Okay. Again, are you doing okay? I hope this is working okay. I really can't tell. Just a second. Ah. Well, I'm going to have to hope that it is working. All right. Now, as I mentioned, the missionaries came in the end of 1850. And within a very short time, I mean literally within a very short time, within weeks, uh, the missionaries had discovered the challenges of serving here in Hawaii. One of the foremost of those challenges was that the Hawaiian language was extremely difficult to learn. Uh, according to some, it's one of the hardest languages in the world to master. And the first missionaries that came, George Q. Cannon and the others, determined that they were just going to teach the white men, the Howleys as they were called, teach the white men here and, uh, and, and, and not worry about them. But George Q. Cannon was of a different attitude. He determined that I'm going to teach all men, be they white or red, he said. And so he determined he would learn the Hawaiian language. And somehow, by faith and the gift of tongues, George Q. Cannon learned the Hawaiian language enough to communicate. So much so, in fact, that he was enabled with the help of others to find converts and would eventually translate the Book of Mormon into Hawaiian. Yesterday, we went to the temple Friday, rather, we went to the temple here in Laie, and as you walk into the temple, right there, when you first walk in, right there on the wall, guess who? A portrait of George Q. Cannon, the first missionary here in Hawaii. Well, Cannon and others served for three and a half years. Now, by the October conference of 18... Now, I, I say that because about half of the missionary force, five of them, returned to Utah. But Cannon and Bigler and others stayed. Among them, Alma Lamoni Smith on his first mission to Hawaii. By October Conference 1853, that was an interesting time because there were almost 3,000 baptized Latter-day Saints on the, in, here in the Hawaiian Islands, and there were some 53 branches of the church by 1853. From 1853 to 1854, though, there was a great deal of persecution got up here on the islands because of polygamy. Everyone else in the world turned against the church because of polygamy, and Hawaii was no different. Then, according to the historians, a ship came into the harbor I'm not sure if this was in Oahu, on Oahu, or whether it was Hawaii, but a ship called the Charles Mallory came ashore. And on board that ship, the, 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 the occupants rather, was someone with smallpox. And the smallpox immediately spread over the island of Oahu. And many, tragically, Many of the most faithful members of the church died from the effects of that disease. It was so prevalent that by the time it was done, some 5,000 people on Oahu died from the effects of the smallpox. And that was, just the, that was just one of the incidences of it. So many members of the church were suffering from this terrible smallpox epidemic that the elders were blessing and administering to many. It is said in their diaries, using more than two quarts of consecrated oil a day. You know that in those days, they anointed more than just the crown of the head with that oil. All the while this is going on, the missionaries are struggling to understand why. Why? Because the ones that were dying were some of the most faithful elders and sisters that they had among the Hawaiians. One of the missionaries at that time, Elder Benjamin F. Johnson, Benjamin Franklin Johnson, poured out his heart to the Lord, sick at heart, 
to see the pain and agony as whole families of newly baptized Latter-day Saints, the faithful and the zealous, were taken by, the, by this disease. He wrote, quote, when most of our dearest and most zealous brothers and friends, our most active help in the ministry were taken, my heart wept and my whole soul cried out to the Lord for that poor people. I was in a great affliction, he said, and marveled that the Lord would permit all his most faithful servants to die, the ones so dear to us, whose help with which we so much needed. And Johnson said, I pondered the subject prayerfully until the light of the Lord shone upon my understanding. And listen to this. He said, I saw multitudes of their race in the spirit world who lived long before them and that there was not one priest among those in the spirit world to teach them the gospel. The voice of the spirit said to me, quote, sorrow not for they, meaning your departing friends, they are now doing that greater work for which they were prepared, and it is all of the Lord. End of quote. Beautiful. As I said, some 5,000 people were killed by that smallpox epidemic in 1853. One of the places I took my group was in downtown a downtown Honolulu, where there's a little out-of-the-way park called Kaka'ako. And in there, in that little park, unmarked, no signs, is a mass grave of 1,000 Hawaiians that were killed in 1853 by smallpox. I took my group there, and I told them that story. The beauty of that, that why did the most faithful have to suffer and die? Because their fathers and mothers needed them on the other side of the veil now to teach them the gospel, having the true doctrine and the authority of the priesthood. Beautiful. Now, one of the first people to pass through these islands, but he didn't stay here, was... Uh, three missionaries called out of Nauvoo in the, I think, 1840-41. Uh, Addison Pratt, uh, Benjamin Gruard, and Noah Rogers. Those three men were called to go to the islands of the Pacific. Well, they wound up going to Tahiti and places like that and serving down there, but they passed through Hawaii on the way down. And as I thought about them and, and these other brethren, so many of them who came down from the States and served here in the islands, this story is about the wives and children left back home while their husbands labored in this paradise in the middle of nowhere. And, and truly, right where I'm at right now, we are right at 2,400 miles from San Diego on the California coastline, and even further than that from Japan. So we are about as far away from anybody here as we can possibly get. So what about the mothers and the children back home? Well, this is the story of Louisa Barnes Pratt. She was living in Nauvoo, Illinois in 1846. Her husband, as I said, Addison, had been called to serve as a missionary in the South Pacific. He answered the call, upped and left, leaving Louisa there in Nauvoo to fend for herself with three little children. Then, in the spring of 46, the call came for the saints to flee Nauvoo and go west. <laughs> Louisa was... I suppose, a little indignant, and she went to one of the leaders of the church, and she said, and I quote, I asked him if he could divine the reason why those who had sent my husband to the ends of the earth 
did not call to inquire whether I could prepare myself for such a perilous journey, or, she said, if I wished to go or stay. The, the presiding priesthood officer's answer, it wasn't Brother Brigham, it was somebody else, said, and I quote, Sister Pratt, they, meaning the church leaders, expect you to be smart enough to go yourself without help and even to assist others, end of quote. <laughs> well, go chew on those apples. Well, what happens next represents the spirit, not only of Amanda or of, of, of Louisa Barnes Pratt, but so many of those early sisters who were left alone to care for their families when their husbands went off to serve. This is what happens. Louisa wrote in her diary, quote, the remark awakened in me a spirit of self-reliance. Self and I replied, well, I will show them what I can do, end of quote. And she did. I nerved up my heart, she said, and put all my energies to the test to get ready, determined to follow the church come life or death. And death would just about be the outcome for her. She talked about how as, they, as the church went across Iowa in the spring of 1846, she talked about the mud. Yesterday, she said, we traveled the most intolerable roads. And yet in the next entry in her diary, Louisa chose not to look at the mud. She said, quote, I begin now to admire the country. Such a beautiful rolling prairie, she wrote. You can almost see in her diary this conscious decision to look away from her afflictions and to be of good cheer. She wrote, it comes suddenly to my mind how far I am going away from home, parents, and every relative I have in the world. But the Lord has called us and appointed us a place where we can live in peace and be free. End of quote. Eventually, Louisa and her family arrived in winter quarters on the Missouri River, and like so many others, Louisa became deathly ill. She wrote, quote, The shaking ague, malaria, fastened deathless fangs upon me from which there is no escape. I shook until it appeared to me my very bones were pulverized. I wept and I prayed. Her children, similarly afflicted by the malaria, huddled by their mother, exposed to the elements on the Missouri. In time, Louisa's fever broke, only for a time, and she managed, by the help of someone else and just good, gritty determination, to hire a man to make a sod hut for her, a soddy, 10 feet by 12 feet. And when he finished making it, she hung up a blanket for a door, built a fire in her new chimney, drew up her rocking chair before it, and that moment felt as rich, she said, as some persons would to be moved into a costly building. Thus, she wrote, we learn to prize enjoyments by sacrifices. Her sufferings and sacrifices continued. The sickness ebbed and flowed through the winter, and yet she never surrendered to a complaining spirit. In the spring of 1848, she once again answered the call of the brethren and set out for the Salt Lake Valley. It was hard for me, she wrote, to waive the dread of a never-ending journey. But once again, Louisa Barnes Platt, Pratt plucked up her spirits, and when she was three weeks out on the trail, she said, there was not a more mirthful woman in the whole company. The grandeur of nature filled me with grateful aspirations. It culminated in this. As she crossed over the Rocky Mountains, Louisa summarized her journey as follows. Although we had been compelled to leave Nauvoo, we did not feel like outcasts. We realized that our Heavenly Father had made a beautiful world and desired that his children should enjoy it. 
And then, just outside of Salt Lake City, as the company was struggling over Big Mountain, objects, she said, that seemed almost insurmountable, she wrote what many would consider unbelievable. Now consider, she has come almost 1,100 miles. She said, I feel now as if I could go another 1,000 miles, end of quote. She would go on to say, August 20th, 1848, we have ascended an eminence, Big Mountain, where with the spyglass we can now see the Great Salt Lake in the valley of which the saints are located, our hearts leap for joy, end quote. I admire the courage and determination of those women and children who were left behind as their missionaries came to places like Oahu, Hawaii, Tahiti, and places elsewhere in the world. But there's a lesson you and I can learn from them. It is a true principle that our hearts can only leap for joy as high as we allow them to jump. As President Hinckley said, no sour-faced pickle suckers allowed. That attitude does not jump for joy. It wallows in the mud and chooses to stay there. And our divine nature is not to wallow. It is to seek joy. All right. Last story for this makeshift last-minute fireside. This is in next week's curriculum for Sunday School. On one occasion, the Lord Jesus Christ beached a small boat near Capernaum. As soon as he did, he was met there by Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue there in Capernaum. Jairus's 12-year-old daughter was dying. We're not told why or what the affliction was, only that the onward roll of nature that brings death to us all was nigh to claiming this beloved daughter. Desperate, desperate to save his daughter, Jairus, the master of the synagogue, came to the Savior and said, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, and she shall live. Mark 5.23 Recognizing that this was real and genuine faith, Jesus agreed to go. While they were en route, and it isn't that far, they were met by messengers from Jairus' house announcing the thing he least wanted to hear, that his daughter had died. I love the Savior for what happens right here. Overhearing that dread declaration, Jesus said to Jairus, be not afraid, only believe. He comforted him, encouraged him, bolstered his faith. Don't give up, hold on. They continued up the street and arrived at Jairus's house. When they came in, the professional mourners were already there and they were weeping and wailing and causing an irksome disruption to the spirit of the Lord. Jesus said to them, why weep ye? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And it says that they laughed him to scorn. Quickly and earnestly, Jesus put them out of the house, cleared them out. And then, taking Peter, James, and John, and the damsel's parents, they go into the death chamber where the daughter of Jairus lay. Can you imagine the feelings and emotions of those parents and the hope that burns within you that maybe Jesus can help? Jesus approached the bed and taking the girl by the hand, he said, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And immediately 
the girl sat up. And even more, she began to walk. Jesus said to them, give her something to eat. And then he also said, tell no man what happened here. Meaning, as I suppose, this event is sacred. It is not for you to testify of it to others in detail. It is your sacred miracle. Well, I think that I can imagine that moment when he presents the daughter alive and well to her parents. I think I can almost see the warm and tender smile on the Savior's face as he witnesses that joyful reunion between parents and daughter. I love this story. It's beautiful. I'm a dad. I have five beautiful daughters and two wonderful sons. My thoughts to you now come more in the form of a question than a statement. I wonder how many times nature has dictated a disaster to befall your loved ones, and it has been averted because you prayed and called down the powers of a loving, merciful, affectionate, and tender God. And he heard you, and he interceded and saved them. How many priceless blessings have you and I received in such a manner and never knew who brought them to us? I guess I'm a simple-minded lad, enough so to believe that this has happened many times for you and for me. I would hope that you and I would not underestimate the power of prayer on behalf of those we love, that we would never stop praying for those we love by name and in detail and thereby place our loved ones under the umbrella of a loving God's care each day. As I said, I'm just simple-minded enough to believe parents and grandparents that the power of your faith and your uttered prayers will influence generations. And that is my testimony. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Next week, my friends, I will be somewhere in the Middle East, Egypt, Israel, or somewhere in between. I'm not exactly sure where I'll be, but if I can come to you, I will. Good night, and God bless.